Hello everyone. Uh, the last topic that we want to discuss about the description of programming languages is uh, compilers. Uh, so the question is, how can the syntactic description of a language be used to automatically translate a program? So for example, how can the syntactic description in the form of a context-free grammar be used to automatically translate a program? Well, we can do this by using a compiler. So what is a compiler? Well, a compiler is a program that uh, takes uh, a program written in some source language and uh, generates another program written in the object language. And a compiler uh, comp uh, comprises a series of different phases or modules. And these different modules they start with the string uh, representing the program in the source language and then they generate various internal intermediate representations until finally we have a string in the object language. Now this object language can be of, of uh, various forms. It could be uh, high level, it could be low level, or it could be some, somewhere in between, middle level. So for example if we had a, a um, uh, compiler that uh, generates code uh, in uh, C, so the object language is C, then that would be called a middle level uh, la uh, language. So it, it will be generating code for a middle level language. Uh, the Java compiler generates Java bytecode as we have discussed and that's some kind of a low level language. That is, that is uh, even though it's not machine language, it's a kind of a low level language. So there are there are different uh, uh, levels of the object language we could say and here is a um, list uh, of the various components of uh, or the various phases of a compiler so at the very top we have a source program the source program is the program that uh, the compiler takes as input and the purpose is to uh, translate the source program finally to object code. That's the output of the compiler. So in the first part we have something that is called lexical analysis and we will actually discuss each of these various phases uh, in a minute. But uh, the, the, the uh, function of the lexical an analysis is to identify the tokens in the source program. Uh, the syntactic analysis or the parser takes then the list of tokens and tries to build the, the parse tree or the derivation tree. Uh, then the semantic component takes over which uh, verifies the contextual syntactic constraints as we have discussed. And basically augments the derivation tree means it puts extra information to the parse tree about the about the uh, a, a kind of a semantic information into the into the parse tree then the parse tree can be used to generate intermediate form and then we could perform some optimizations on the intermediate form optimizations on the code that are not really dependent on the underlying hardware but something that can uh, uh, still be optimized just by looking at the intermediate code itself. And then finally there's a code generation phase in which uh, uh, the code for the underlying machine is, is uh, generated and we might do some optimizations on the, on the uh, uh, code there as well which are then dependent on the underlying hardware. And notice also here that uh, there's a separate module here called simple table which um, many of the individual phases of the compiler uh, need or communicate with. And in the simple table we uh, record various symbols that are used in the program. Symbols meaning uh, names of variables, names of functions. Uh, and there we have information about uh, we can store there what are the types of the variables, what are the number of parameters and the types uh, that are de declared for, uh, for functions, and so on. So if we look in, in a little bit more detail at the individual phases of the compiler, then we 
start with the uh, lexical analysis uh, component, or and this is often called scanning. So what is the purpose here? Well, the purpose is to read the symbols of our source program and group them into meaningful units, which are called tokens. So notice, meaningful units. So if we take an example here, the string uh, x is equal to 1 plus foo plus plus. This will produce seven tokens. We have the identifier x, that is a meaningful unit. We have the assignment operator. We have the number one here. We have the addition operator plus. We have the identifier foo. We have the auto increment operator plus plus, and we have the semicolon. Notice that all of these sevens are, are what are called meaningful units. For example, uh, we do not group together uh, the, uh, the, the number one and plus. So the sequence of characters one plus is not a meaningful unit. It, the, we notice that we want the smallest meaningful unit. So one is a separate symbol that stands for a number. So that is a meaningful unit. And plus is a special symbol that stands on its own, so to speak. Which uh, and its meaning is to perform the the addition operation. Uh, what are what are more possible tokens? Well, reserved words of the language, such as for, if, else, etc. Uh, open and close brackets in, uh, for example, the curly brackets in C or Java. All these are tokens as well. Uh, and what is important here is that. In the lexical analysis phase, there is no check made whether this particular sequence of tokens constitute a syntactically correct phrase or not. So what do we mean by this? Well, if we have a sequence of tokens, uh, let's say we have a particular statement in a, a language, in let's say in Java, and we have uh, something like this, one plus uh, semicolon paren. Now, what are the individual tokens here? Well, I is a meaningful token, uh, assignment operator is a meaningful token, uh, the constant one or the number one, the uh, addition operator, the semicolon, and uh, left parenthesis. All these uh, tokens are valid tokens in the in languages like C++ and Java and uh, the function of the lexical analysis would be to return the sequence of tokens. Notice that however this particular stream of tokens do not constitute a valid uh, string in the language. But the lexical analyst doesn't care but because its function is only to identify the tokens, not whether the stream of tokens uh, constitute a valid string. So, and there we, therefore we come to the next part, which is syn uh, syntactic analysis or, or parsing. And the function of the parser is to check to see whether the sequence that it gets from the lexical analyzer constitutes a syntactically correct phrase or not. Uh, often the, the parser tries to construct a parse tree in which each leaf of the tree corresponds to a token from the lexical analyzer. And this is something that we saw earlier. Here is for example a parse tree in which we have tokens at the leaves, so A multiply with B plus a. So if we read the leaves of the past tree, we are indeed reading the tokens, uh, the individual tokens. Now if, uh, if a tree cannot be constructed for a particular string, then we have a syntax error. And so we would assume in the example that I gave earlier here that we cannot uh, 
construct or derive this string here from the language, from the context-free grammar. We cannot uh, build a parse tree for this particular string, and therefore we have a syntax error. So it's the function of the parser to find out whether we have a syntax error in the program or not. Uh, and notice that even though we have these uh, two components kind of a separate lexical analysis analysis and syntactic analysis, they are often interleaved. So usually what happens is that the parser calls the lexical analyzer uh, uh, over and over again to ask it for the next token uh, uh, from, from the input string. So, the th if we look at the figure again, we just talked about the lexical analyzer and the syntax, syntactic ana analyzer, and now we have semantic analysis. And uh, as we have discussed, uh, there might be some uh, uh, contextual syntactic constraints that apply to uh, a given statement. And uh, that's the function of the semantic analyzer to to check these constraints. Uh, so the parse tree is subjected to checks of the language various context-based constraints. And we have actually discussed them earlier, what kind of, uh, of constraints they might apply. For example, the de in declarations, where the variables have been declared or not, the types of the, the, the variables or types of expressions, the number of function parameters, etc. So Often what happens is that the parse tree that comes as a result of the syntax analysis is augmented with some semantic information. For example, every token that corresponds to a variable will be associated with its type. Uh, and uh, scope information, which we will talk about later, and the functions uh, will be associated with the number and the types of the parameters. And all these um, extra informations are, can be stored in this simple table here. And there actually might also be some information in the parse tree as well that are, are retrieved from the simple table. Now, if we go back to our figure, Semantic analysis, we just discussed that one. Then we have generation of intermediate form, then optimization, and then finally code generation. So, generation of intermediate form, well, this is the initial phase of the code generation. Um, but often, instead of generating the uh, underlying machine code, we generate some kind of an intermediate code. And we have seen and discussed examples of this, for example, um, as opposed to uh, uh, generating uh, code for an underlying machine, Java generates intermediate code. And even though a compiler generates uh, a code for the underlying machine, it might actually generate intermediate code first. Uh, and do some optimizations on, on the intermediate code. So we are saying that there are, there are many optimizations left to do, and they are independent on the specific object language. Uh, a compiler is actually often implemented to generate code for a whole series of object languages. So if we have a compiler for a given language and we want to generate code for many different object languages, then it's a, it's a very good idea to generate intermediate code first and then let the backend, as it's called, generate the appropriate object language from this intermediate code. So in, if we do this, we, we are basically um, um, abstracting away the details so the, the front, of the front end of the compiler doesn't have to worry about the underlying machine, it just generates intermediate code, and then there are some specific modules in the back end that will generate the uh, appropriate machine language or object language depending on using the intermediate code as, as input. Uh, 
Uh, before we generate the update code, we might do some optimizations on the intermediate code. There might there are various things that can happen when code is, is generated. For example, for some reason there might be some useless code that has been generated, code that will actually never be executed. So the optimization phase might uh, remove uh, this code. We might want to do some inline expansion of function calls. What does this mean? Well, this means that instead of calling the function, we uh, put the code of the function at the place where we called it. So why would we want to do that? Well, because calling a function is costly in a sense that we have to... Um, there, there, there are a separate uh, uh, activation records that will be put on the runtime stack when we call a function, and this is something that we will discuss later in the, in the, in the course. And so uh, for functions that are called over and over again, we might want to, instead of calling them, we might want to uh, expand our code with the code of the function uh, at, at, the type, at the time of the call. So what I'm trying to say here is that instead of calling a function f, where f is... Uh, declared and does something, then when we call f, let's say in our main program, then inline expansion of f means that instead of calling it and jumping in machine code to the memory address where uh, the code for f is uh, kept, we take the code of f and replace the call with the code itself. This is inline expansion. So that means we don't have to perform the function call in machine code. Uh, Sub-expression factorization. Sometimes what happens is that in expressions we are computing the same value maybe twice. This could happen in th where we have something like x is equal to 2 divided by 4 plus i minus 2 divided by uh, 4. It's a strange example here, but this something similar to this could happen, actually. And here we're basically computing the same value twice in the expression, and we m the compiler might uh, um, optimize this, so this would only be computed once, this value 2 divided by 4. And uh, on the loops there are some uh, optimizations that uh, might be carried out. Uh, um, uh, among these are, are uh, for example, removing some statements from inside the loop whose value uh, remains constant during uh, different uh, iterations. So, we would, we would not compute that value over and over again because it's a constant value. And uh, let's say we have a loop like this. And inside our loop, we do something, well, we could actually just take our statement from the earlier example and notice here that this value is a constant that doesn't change uh, between iterations so instead of computing this each and every time we execute the loop we could replace this with um, uh, the value 0 0.5 And finally, in the code generation phase, the code generator fa the phase uses uses the the result of the intermediate 
generation, so the optimized intermediate form comes into the code generation form uh, module. And uh, this is the last uh, phase of the compiler. And here we might do some optimization, which is actually dependent on the object language, on the underlying machine. So notice that we have we can do optimizations on two different levels on the intermediate code, which is independent of the target machine. And then we might do some optimizations that depend on the particular instruction set of the of the underlying machine. And one of one an important part here, uh, if we're generating, for example, machine code, is to is for the compiler to, to decide what values are, are put in, in registers because that has a significant effect on the uh, efficiency of the generated code, which values are kept in registers. Remember that when we usually for these uh, processors, uh, operations are done on values that are kept in registers. So if we are doing a lot of operations for particular variables, it's important that the values for these variables are kept in, in registers.